Thank you all for coming to hear about wood chip. Uh, my name is Ben Raskin. I, I wear a few hats. Uh, I'm a horticulturalist by background, commercial vegetable grower. Uh, I work, uh, or have been working at the Soil Association for uh, around 16 years. Um, and I also manage uh, the agroforestry at Helen Browning's farm near Swindon, which is a 1,500 acre farm. And we're gradually retreeing it, uh, as well as writing the odd book and doing a bit of consultancy. Uh, now, just to warn you, there's no screen in front of me, so I've got a laptop here. So if I sort of occasionally glance off to the side, it's just so that I can check what's, what slide I'm on and I don't get myself confused. So if we start with uh, where wood chip comes from, I mean, obviously it comes from wood and trees. It's actually, it's a relatively new product in sort of terms of human evolution. The first wood chipper was only invented in 1884. Uh, so we haven't had you know that long really to understand it and to to make full use of it. Uh, and effectively, any wood can be chipped. Um, there are there are some uh, limitations or challenges with particular woods in particular situations, but mostly any tree is good for chip, and most chip can be used in most situations. Uh, and there's a whole range of machinery that you can use. You know, right from a pair of secateurs and a sledgehammer at the smallest scale right up to these sort of monster machines that can devour a whole tree in a, in a couple of minutes. And I thought, I mean, probably a lot of people will have used wood chip for mulching. Uh, that's certainly how I first started using it. Uh, and it is a great material for mulching. So I thought I would start with that and then we can sort of go on to some of the other myriad of ways you can, you can use it on farm. And, and sort of broadly speaking, I thought I'd just look at a, a number of ways in which it benefits as a mulch. So there's water retention, uh, there's obviously weed control, temperature modulation, uh, pests and, and disease control, uh, and also for preventing splash, which is quite helpful. So I'll go through each of those uh, in turn. So looking at weed control, in, in its sort of most basic form, like any mulch, you're creating a barrier between light and the weed. You know, so you're you're stopping the plant from from getting access to sunlight, and that you know that is effective in a number of ways. The advantage with wood chip over, say, uh, a compost mulch, is it actually it's, it's a quite unattractive uh, surface for a weed to grow on, and particularly an annual. Uh, weed. Oh, we've got a, a, a collapse of pull-ups. Um, so not only is it, particularly if it's fresh wood chip. Oh my God, they're all falling. Where's my branding gone? Um, so it's it. You know, if you've got particularly if you've got fresh wood chip, it's a it's hard surface. It's got no moisture. So if a weed seed lands on that, it's not going to germinate. It doesn't like it. It's going to die off. So it's really good at at preventing annual weed control. <laughs> also, with certain wood chips, there's going to be um, volatile chemicals on that wood chip that have an allopathic effect on some germination of some, some species of weed. So you've got, you've got that kind of physical barrier, but you've also got chemical stuff going on there. As the wood chip degrades, obviously, it, and composts, it becomes more attractive, and eventually, you know, it'll become rather a nice place for weeds to germinate. So it doesn't have a very long-term weed control effect, but it will, you know, fresh wood chip will certainly control weeds for, uh, for a year or two. However, it, it isn't good at, at uh, controlling perennial weeds. So those of you thinking you might have found your, you know, solution for creeping thistle or, or cooch grass, I'm sorry to disappoint you, because uh, what happens is obviously perennial weeds have quite a lot of strength. You know, they've got all this reserves in their root systems. They push up through the wood chip. And once they get up through the wood chip, you've removed all of the competition. So they've got this lovely growing environment, uh, and they do really well. And there's a little uh, creeping thistle poking its way up through. And quite quickly, that turns into that. Uh, so this is a tree row uh, at Eastbrook where we've mulched the whole row with wood chip. Uh, and you know, we now have a lovely uh, row of creeping thistle, which initially I was slightly panicky about. Uh, it's not near a road, so no one's seeing it. So we're not too embarrassed from that point of view. Uh, it's amazing for wildlife. You know, the, the goldfinches are all over it. It's, it's great. And actually, it's not competing with the trees at this point. 
Uh, you know, the trees have got a good mulch, they're established, they're growing through it. So actually, it's a temporary problem. Uh, you know, and if that was next to, you know, our cereal crops, we might be a bit more concerned. Uh, but actually, it's not creating a massive problem for us. So, so part of this sort of journey, in a way, for us as well with the agroforestry is thinking, is resetting our expectations of what our fields should look like and, and not worrying if they get a bit messy um, and if we have a, a temporary weed problem. Because at some point in that picture, we'll remove the, the electric fences that are protecting the trees. We'll let the, the stock back into graze and you know, we'll be able to manage that. So it's, it's, not, it's not a huge problem and it does you know, have some biodiversity benefits. So this picture here, um, it was an accidental experiment, and it's one of the things that, I, that prompted me to write the book. So the, uh, as you're looking at it, the trees on the left had a very thin mulch of maybe so two or three inches of wood chip. The, the ones on the right had about two and a half foot of mulch. We basically, we'd pollarded a load of willow trees, and we had a mound of chip. We'd thrown it over the fence with the intention of then spreading it out and properly mulching the other trees Farming being what it is, we never quite got around to doing that, and it stayed there. This was 2018, when it was really hot, really dry. All of those trees you can see in the picture were planted on the same day uh, in February 2018. Uh, and the ones on the right, this was uh, taken, I think, a year and a half ago. The ones on the right now are, you know, 16, 20 feet tall, and the ones on the left are up to about here. And I think that's almost entirely down to moisture retention in my opinion. I mean, I haven't you know, done all the controlled experiments, but it was such a hot, dry year. In a different year, we might not have seen the same extremes, um, but it was, it was so striking. There might also have been a degree of temperature modulation. So most of your soil organisms like to operate at sort of medium temperature, around 20, 25 degrees centigrade. They don't like it getting much hotter, although bacteria can cope with it a bit hotter. They don't like it getting much colder. Fungi can cope a little bit colder. Um, but they like it in the middle, and most plants like it in the middle. So the, the cooler you can keep your soil in the summer and the warmer you can keep it in the winter, uh, the happier your plants and your soil biology is going to be. Uh, and a good mulch will do that. Uh, so typically, it could, in a, you know, if you've got a really cold winter, it might keep it 10 degrees warmer. Uh, and in a hot summer, it will slow down how quickly the, the soil heats up uh, and keep it cooler. So one of, the, one of the sort of problems you get sometimes with plants is you get this, particularly in really heavy rain, which we're getting more and more of now with this sort of extreme climate events. On bare soil, you get the, these big rain droplets splashing up. You, you get, you know, particularly on sort of plants that have low growing leaves, they splash up, you get kind of this wet, muddy environment around the lower leaves, which is perfect for disease. By putting a wood chip mulch around it or by building the, the organic matter in your soil, you're reducing that splash. Uh, and there was a study in the States looking at uh, box trees, which get this box blight. Uh, they, they put a mulch down after the leaves had dropped. They put a mulch down around the trees and saw 97% reduction in disease. They've pretty much eliminated that. And they think the two reasons, one is they were trapping the spores under the wood chip and then they were preventing splashback from the soil. So again, in certain situations that could be really helpful. So pests and diseases, this little chap looks quite friendly, doesn't he? Nice eating his worm. Um, but obviously big problem uh, in a lot of tree planting is voles. When we started planting at Eastbrook, uh, almost immediately, within weeks, the voles moved down. I don't know where they were living before, but they, they found their way into their field very, very quickly. Um, and we've experimented with lots of different ways of controlling weeds. We're an organic farm, so we couldn't spray. Uh, but we, we looked at uh, mulch mats. Uh, we looked at wood chip. We looked at just strimming and sort of keeping it cut that way. Where we used a mulch mat, and we tried both sort of plastic ones and the sort of hessian ones, it seemed to create this lovely little environment for, for voles. It was dry, it was warm, they were protected from predators. It was like our own little vole hotels that we put all over the field for them. Where we put wood chip directly on the soil, we had almost no vole damage. Uh, and we're not quite sure why. I mean, I think maybe it's falling into their runs, so they don't really like it very much. It's more open for predators. So along with all of these voles that suddenly appeared, we also had 
almost immediate increase in populations of kestrels, buzzards, kites, barn owls, you know. So we're, it, it was astonishing, actually, how quickly all of that arrived. And clearly, some of that is a challenge, and some of it's brilliant. But, but we did notice that even though we've still got loads of voles, they're not eating the trees. Um, and we've had almost no, no damage on the trees, which is a relief, if I'm honest. Um, the disease bit is interesting as well, and it's, it's underexplored, I would say. Um, so one of the, the banners that is, I think Julie's holding up behind there, uh, that's falling over. We did an innovative farmer's field lab looking at using willow wood chip in uh, orchards. So willow has uh, salicylic acid in it, aspirin, I'm sure you all know. Uh, and as well as helping, you know, make my headache get better, it also seems to stimulate an immune reaction in plants. Uh, so a researcher called Glyn Percival had seen this uh, effect in one of his uh, studies, and we wanted to test it in commercial situations. So we worked with some uh, cider growers in Somerset, and we looked at putting a mulch of freshly chipped willow around trees, uh, and, and then as the salicylic acid sort of washes through and is leached out of the trip to the, the, the chip down into the root zone, uh, it seems to kind of boost their ability to, uh, to resist scab or, and other diseases potentially. The, the trial wasn't conclusive, but it did show a trend. And there were a number of factors. So one is uh, cider apples are collected by machine. Uh, and the growers were really nervous about chip ending up in their, in their orchards. So they didn't put as much chip on as they were supposed to in some cases. The other interesting thing is the levels of salicylic acid in different willow species are dramatically different. So some are up to 20 times higher than others. So actually having you know, the species with the really high levels might help. Uh, and actually most of it is in the bark. So if you could find a source of willow bark, that might be even more effective. Uh, and the timing's important as well. Um, so you have to wait until the sap's rising in the willow so that the salicylic acid is there. And then you have to apply it pretty fresh because it gets leached out quite quickly. So you've got quite a short window in the spring to do it. Um, but there's, there's, I think potentially there's lots of effects from different single species wood chip that might have different effects on trees. And you know, clearly we need to look at that a lot more. So that's mulches. Um, so I... One of the things, apart from this sort of extraordinary uh, growth on the trees, one of the sort of this journey with wood chip, I guess, was I, I kept seeing wood chip coming up in different ways. So as well as that wood, uh, willow one we did, there was another innovative farmer's field lab looking at using it for uh, compost propagation, which I'll come on to. Uh, and, and then I saw someone using it for a hotbed. I kept thinking, God, there's, there's more to this kind of wood chip stuff. And then... The Organic Research Centre were doing a, a project looking at ramial wood chip, which is the stuff that comes from branches that are less than seven centimetres in diameter. And they were trialling spreading this directly on the soil. And so all of these things came together. And, and there's a grower called Ian Tolhurst, Tolly, that a lot of you will know, who's been experimenting with wood chip for, you know, sort of 10 years probably or more. And, and although he's been growing for 40 years, you know, hugely experienced, innovating all the time with all kinds of intercropping and green manures, he says that it's only since he started wood using wood chip on his soil that he's seen this sort of extra boost to his productivity and soil health. Um, and I remember standing with him in one of his fields, and he's not on the best growing land at all. He's on grade three something, you know, it's, it's not great soil. Uh, and we were standing, he said, oh, I, you know, I put some wood chip on this. He was using composted wood chip. I put some wood chip on this soil, uh, you know, a few weeks ago. And we looked down, and there wasn't a bit of the soil that wasn't a worm cast. Uh, it, it was extraordinary, you know. And I thought, what? You know, it's kind of almost like you could feel it almost moving under your feet. And so I started, when I was doing the book, I started researching it a bit. And, you know, going back to Darwin and his book on worms, you know, he, he was estimating worm populations of 133,000 a hectare. Well, during this wood chip project the ORC did, Tolly recorded uh, 8 million worms per hectare. Uh, you know, so he, he's, and he's a vegan organic farmer. He says, I don't have livestock, but I do farm worms. You know, so he, if you think of the volume of worms, it's kind of, it is mad. It is mad. This picture is quite fresh wood chip, as you can see. It's not really composted very much. And this was being stored on a concrete pad. So we get at the farm, we have two or three 
tree surgeons that are giving us their wood chip for free. And you would think, sitting on a concrete pad, freshly delivered from the tree surgeon, that worms wouldn't find their way in. You'd think they'd wait until it was a bit more composted or it was on the soil. But actually, you know, there's worms in this quite fresh wood chip on concrete. So, so they do come in quite quickly. Uh, and there's, that there's quite a lot of studies showing the benefit of uh, adding wood chip to soil. There's one that shows, you know, three times increase in worm populations when you added a hard wood chip to the soil. So, you know, there are, we can, we can go on and we can talk about the risk of nitrogen robbing, which I know is sort of one of the big fears. Um, but if you, if you do it with a few caveats, there's some real potential to build your worm populations. Which brings us to fungi, uh, the other major player when it comes to wood chip. Uh, so mostly wood and wood chip is broken down by fungi. Bacteria need higher levels of nitrogen than are generally present. You can obviously can mix wood chip as they're doing here. You can mix wood chip with manure or with higher nitrogen materials, which is fine and it speeds up the, the decomposition. But actually wood chip will break down very happily on its own, but it needs fungi rather than bacteria. Uh, and, and it tends to take a bit longer and it tends to stop in really hot weather. So, you know, in the summer, the breakdown slows down. In the winter, it speeds up, which is sort of slightly counterintuitive. Um, and, and also, with fungi, fungi don't like being disturbed. So having a static heap often is quite good for building fungi levels. Uh, and I'm sure some of you will come, have come across the johnson Sue bioreactor method of composting, which is a sort of static, aerated way of composting. And they've shown that you get much higher diversity of organisms within these static piles than you do when you turn them. Having said that, if you've got a big pile of wood chip and you turn it occasionally, it will still break down and turn into a lovely material. So it, you know, it's pretty easy to do low tech, um, but you will definitely build your, your soil fungi. Uh, and it's a really good way of shifting your uh, fungi bacterial ratio in your soil towards the fungi which for a lot of plants is really helpful, and particularly when you're planting trees into land that hasn't had trees for a while, it will tend to be more bacterial soil. Trees really like more fungi, so having a wood chip content to that, I think, really benefits the establishment of your, of your trees. So for those of you looking at agroforestry and looking to plant into, into soil that hasn't had trees, I can't overemphasize how useful wood chip is. Um, you know, not only for all of those mulching benefits, but also to build the, the fungi bit. So, um, so we talked a little bit, well, I didn't talk about, I mentioned this sort of idea of nitrogen robbing or nitrogen lockup. So one of the big fears, and I think one of the things that's held back our appreciation of wood chip uh, is the kind of the, the fear of, of locking up nitrogen and of sort of causing those imbalances of nutrients in the soil. It is a risk, um, but it is a small risk in my opinion. Uh, so even fungi need some nitrogen to break down the wood. They don't need as much as bacteria, but they do need some. And there's often very little in the chip itself, and particularly if it's older wood, it will mostly be carbon. So the fungi will start scavenging around looking for sources of nitrogen. Uh, and they'll find some usually in, in the soil. What they tend, from what I can gather, what happens is they, they tend to take it from about one centimeter within where they touch the soil. So if you're spreading it on the surface, it's only taking nitrogen probably from that top one centimeter of soil. So mostly, if you're using it on anything that's deep rooted, there's almost no risk because your trees are down a foot or two. By the time they get down there, they're not going to be robbing. And it starts, as soon as it starts to break down, obviously, it's releasing any nitrogen that it's, that it's locked up. So it's a temporary effect anyway. You can mitigate that by mixing it in with manure. Uh, there's even some farmers mixing artificial nitrogen with wood chip to, to reduce their leaching. This picture here is, uh, is a sort of massive, what they're calling a bioreactor. Uh, so there's a, it's in America. There's a big field of maize. Uh, they were having some problems with nitrogen leaching coming out of that crop. Uh, one solution might have been to undersow it, but they were trialing out effectively digging a huge pit, filling it with wood chip and, and filtering the runoff from that crop through, through the wood chip. 
and it worked. It reduced, it reduced the leaching into the watercourses, and then after two or three years, you dig up all the, all the wood chip, use it somewhere else, and refill it with fresh wood chip. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily the ideal solution to the problem, but it, what it does show is that it's really good at holding on and capturing nitrogen and releasing it more slowly. Um, and, and certainly, you know, in terms of using wood chip for your own composting systems, even if it's not everything that you do, it's a really good way uh, of capturing loose nitrogen from whatever source you're using. So, you know, if you've got slurry, mixing slurry with wood chip or mixing manure with wood chip is, is a really good way of maximizing the, the, you know, the nutrients in that material. So, ramiel or ramiel wood chip, these, this small stuff. Um, the benefit of this is because the wood that you're taking it from has got a much higher proportion of bark, and the bark is where all the you know, other nutrients are. The center bit is mostly carbon. The, the outside bit is where the nitrogen and the other nutrients are. So if you're using small wood to make the wood chip, you've got a much higher proportion of those other nutrients in it. So your risk of lockup is much smaller. Uh, so this, the project we did with Organic Research Center, it was looking at spreading this wood chip directly on the soil, so chipping it and spreading it. So no composting, uh, no anything else. And they tried it in three different farms. They tried it at, at Ian Tolhurst, they tried it at Wakelands, and they tried it with um, an arable farm, conventional arable farmer in Hampshire. Uh, three different systems, three different ways of doing it. None of them saw ill effects from using it. Now, it's quite a long-term thing, so they didn't also see any immediate benefits. Uh, Tolly had been using wood chip for quite a while, so he was comparing it against his composted wood chip applications. The, there's only really, as far as, I can, as far as I can tell, been two studies. One is in the 1980s in Canada, and the other was this one three or four years ago. So again, it's an area that's really understudied. For me, the, the potential benefit of it is you remove that whole need to process and to compost and to transport. So if you're, you know, if you could capture your hedge clippings, for instance, or if you're doing short rotation coppice, you can just cut it and spread it where it is. You know, if you're wanting to build soil health, for instance, you haven't got to put it in a trailer, take it away, compost it, put it back in a trailer, bring it back, spread it. You know, so it potentially is a way of really building your soil health and your soil carbon quite easily with really, you know, all you need is effectively is a chipper and possibly a spreader. Um, but again, you know, lots more work to be done on that. The other big area, and I know, you know, there's lots of farmers trialing this, uh, is, is using wood chip for livestock bedding. It's particularly useful, I think, in areas of the country where straw is hard to get hold of. Um, the price volatility is less with wood chip. Um, so although, you know, it's clearly it's not a free resource from that point of view mostly, but you're less likely to sort of suddenly get stung by massive straw prices. Uh, the leaching from manure made with wood chip has been shown to be less than that made with straw. So that point I made earlier about holding on to nutrients, um, you, get, you get lower levels of particularly nitrogen and phosphorus leaching from a wood chip bedding. Uh, and if it's done right, it can be sort of drier and cleaner. Um, but again, you know, there are, I think it's one of those things where you, you know, as you change a system, you, you need to get used to it. So I know some farmers have sort of tried it and go, oh, it didn't really work. Um, and it might be that they were using the wrong type of wood chip or they hadn't quite got their system right. Um, you have to be a little bit careful with uh, certainly things like um, blackthorn or, you know, things that might sort of cause problems to, to feet. There's also uh, some species uh, are potentially poisonous when fresh, so you've got to be a little bit careful if you're putting it in with livestock to make sure that you're not you know, risking poisoning them. But again, real, real opportunity, I think, for farms to become more self-sufficient in their inputs, particularly for, for uh, you know, livestock-only farms where they you know, could be not reliant then on, on other sources. And there are some farmers like here actually that are really starting to experiment with this at scale this is a picture of um waddiston estate uh, so garth clark's been experiment with stuff uh, you know six thousand acres he's invested in really big sort of machinery to, to compost and to mix stuff uh, they're chipping a lot of wood they're mixing it with you know manure and other stuff really interesting uh, work and i think there's more of these bigger estates are starting to look at how the, how they can effectively internalize some of their fertility and their soil 
health boosting stuff. And just, you know, it may not be relevant to everybody here, but I can't resist a bit of horticulture. Um, so just a little bit about sort of uh, the potential use in horticulture. Uh, we all know that we need to not use peat, and peat is still used a lot uh, in horticultural propagation. Uh, there are an increasing number of alternative products. I think woodchip really offers a massive opportunity because one of the problems of peat-free substrates is actually getting hold of enough material to, to replace the amount of peat that's used. And obviously, wood chip potentially is readily available. It's really easy to use. So this uh, field lab that we did with, again, with Tolly, the wood chip hero, uh, he did a trial with uh, cabbages and leeks and, we, and, uh, and then using wood chip with, with and without biochar and using a leading peat-based commercial product with and without biochar. Uh, and there was no difference in germination and success of those seedlings. So effectively, we showed that it was, it, it was replaceable. The only difference in the trial, actually, was once they were planted out, we monitored uh, disease levels. And the, the compost that had either the wood chip or the biochar in had less uh, rust on the leeks. So you know, we don't know why exactly. It might be increased biology. But but basically, in, in that those two crops in that system, you could replace peat with wood chip. And I think you know again, more work needs to be done to, on a range of crops and a range of different systems. Uh, but there's definitely potential there. Uh, and the picture on the left is is Tolly's strawberry plants grown in wood chip. So you can see they're really you know healthy. This hasn't got added nutrients in. This is there's a little bit of I think he adds a little bit of perlite and vermiculite for drainage. Um, but effectively, really healthy looking. Uh, plants. The one on the right uh, is uh, Fred Bonestrew, who's a grower um, in Gloucestershire, and he's actually he uses a lot of wood chip, but there he's just using it to grow squashes in the piles that he's composting. So again, it's you know it's not really part of his production, but it's a way of using it. Even while they're just sitting there in a heap and composting, you can grow things like potatoes and squashes in them. Uh, and, and then potentially, you know, it's a really good material to incorporate into no-dig systems. It's clean. Uh, you know, it's, if you compost it properly, it should be pretty weed-free. Um, and you don't, you know, it's not too rich. So the problem we're using a lot of manure in no-dig systems potentially is that you, you sort of build up too high a fertility level, whereas, you know, small amounts of wood chip is quite a good way of, of getting that nice surface. Which brings us on to uh, where you get it from. Uh, I'm guessing most people here are farmers, so they're not going to be buying bags of uh, wood chip at £60 a uh, cubic metre, or, or even I've seen it sold at £150 a cubic metre. Um, you know, for gardeners, that might be sensible, uh, but using it at any scale is not really, is not really where it's at. Uh, tree surgeons are definitely worth exploring. So we have three tree surgeons that, that drop us uh, wood chip at the farm. Uh, it helps if you've got easy access, you know, which we have, and a nice concrete pad for them to reverse onto. If, you know, if your access is difficult, it's tricky. Uh, there's also parts of the country where it's getting harder to get hold of free wood chip, I have heard, the Midlands being one of them. Um, Bristol, apparently, it's quite hard to get hold of free wood chip. So I think it's becoming more recognized as a valuable resource. There's this website called Arb Talk, which is a sort of tree surgeon's website where you can register yourself as a tip site for wood chip. Uh, and, and then, you know, local tree surgeons, if, you know, if you're on their way home, you know, at the moment they still have to pay if they take it to a, a sort of registered site. So it's quite helpful for them to have a local place they can just drop it. I suspect that will become harder. Um, you know, there are some tree surgeons that say, oh, well, you know, 20 quid and I'll drop it or 50 quid and I'll drop it for you. I think that's probably still quite good value, actually. But, um, but having said that, if you can get a hold for free, then that's great. Uh, but what I'm really interested in is starting to build production into farming systems and, and thinking of it as you know, part of your input system and part of your holistic management of the farm. Uh, so there's a few ways that you might be able to do that. Obviously, short rotation coppice is, is probably the most efficient way of doing it in one sense. You, know, you can plant a row, uh, and you, you know, whether that's a single species or a mixed species, you can, you can go in with machinery, it's easy to harvest, it's easy to manage. Uh, and, and I sort of made an estimate in the book, I don't know if you can read that, but um, of 
uh, so how much wood chip you might get from a hectare and how many stems of different varieties you might get. It's quite hard to get hold of some of this information. I mean, obviously, for things like willow and things where it's going into the biomass market, there's more information uh, about those figures, whereas other stuff like, you know, kind of hazel and alder, it gets a bit, a bit trickier. And there's a huge variation, as you can see. Um, ODT, by the way, is oven-dried tons. Um, so that's sort of, uh, in theory, how many tons per hectare you might get out. And um, yeah, you know, willow, four to 30. Yeah, that's, quite <laughs> that's quite a big, a big uh, variation. I would, you know, I would say going for sort of big volume is not necessarily always the best thing. So one of the things we found out uh, in uh, another of the field labs we did was, you know, if you want it for mulch, then actually using a hardwood mulch like hornbeam or oak or something might be more useful. It lasts for two or three years as a mulch, whereas willow will break down more quickly. Uh, and if you've got to apply it two or three times, that's two or three times the cost of spreading it, which is actually probably the biggest cost of using wood chip. Whereas if you've got a really hard wood that lasts for longer, obviously that's reducing your cost of spreading it. Um, but anyway, it, it definitely only meant as a guide. Uh, and I wouldn't particularly recommend using eucalyptus, uh, <laughs> you know, or not on its own anyway. You know, it's, 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 a good, it's good for biomass, but I'm not sure it's the best material for, for, for soil. So the other way you might be able to get it is hedges. Uh, and again, the Organic Research Centre have done some fantastic work on the economics of uh, wood chip from hedges. Um, so there's a potential. That what I did hear of a machinery being developed for capturing when you flail hedges and capturing the stuff from that to use. Um, but actually, I think what's more interesting is, is changing to a coppicing or you know, laying cycle where you know, maybe every 15 years you go in, you get some of it maybe for firewood, some of it for chip. Um, and again, I mean, this is just filtering some of the figures that came out of the ARC work, but I would recommend you go and look at them. They've got the reports downloadable from their website. Really good information. Um, and, and obviously, the economics have probably changed e even in the last sort of three years since they did some of this. Um, but looking at, you know, I was sort of trying to do some basic calculations. It sort of comes out at maybe £20 a cubic metre once, you know, once you've factored in the reduced cost of having to flail every year and all the rest of it. Um, but it, that will depend on yield and growth and, you know, your machinery costs and all the rest of it. So it's not, you know, it's still not a free resource in one sense. Um, but I think that actually represents quite good value if you then think of the biodiversity you're getting, the wind break you're getting. You know, maybe you've got it as part of a, a livestock agroforestry system where they're browsing the hedge some of the time. You know, so if you s start to think of all of the benefits that, that hedge is, is giving you, and if you know, also starting to get some of these biodiversity payments, you know, if you can factor that in and you've got a rotational hedge system, you know, so, so almost treating the wood chip as a, as a kind of nice bonus product that you're getting from the system is, is maybe one way of looking at it. I mean, this is, this is probably a little bit niche, but um, in a lot of coppicing systems and woodland systems, there's still quite a lot of burning going on, which to me is madness. Um, so, so actually trying to find a way, you know, if you are doing some clearing of woodland or you're thinning, I mean, obviously, you don't want to take everything out of a woodland. It's really important to leave stuff in there uh, to break down. But actually thinking, well, is there a use for some of that rather than setting fire to it? Uh, you know, let's, let's wood chip it and use it somewhere else. And then finally, just sort of closing that circle, um, you know, we're looking, certainly we're looking at starting to grow some of our own trees. It's getting quite hard to get hold of trees and so some of the specialist stuff particularly. Um, you know, everybody's planting more trees. There's a real concern about where those trees are going to come from. You know, we don't want to be relying on lots of imports. We've seen what happened with ash dieback. So start, I think most farmers should be starting to think about growing some of their own trees. Uh, and actually, wood chip compost is a really good medium for growing trees in. Um, so this is a picture I took last week at Henbant in um, North Wales, uh, which is a sort of experimental agroforestry system, and he's collecting his own tree seeds and growing them in his wood chip compost. Shameless plug. Uh, um, book available later. Doing book signing at four. Uh, but there's also uh, there is a Facebook group that I've set up, which is Wood Chip for Soil Health. So do look at that. Um, and obviously sort of come and find me. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I'm not sure what the time is. We've got time for questions, I hope. How am I doing for time? Uh, yeah, loads of time for questions. Great, spot on. Any questions? Yeah. 
Uh, there's a mic somewhere. You've got to wait for the mic. Good morning. I'm Rachel Jeffries, a farmer. I really enjoyed your talk, so thank you. Um, and it's quite exciting, really, because I've been using wood chip for years, but never really thought of using for other things other than just mulching around specimen shrubs. So. Yeah. My question is about tree diseases, and if you're bringing in wood chip onto your farm um, from tree surgeons, how do you mitigate that risk? Really good question, and I used to worry about it quite a lot. So the, the, uh, the question was around diseases and you know bringing stuff in, and I did, I did get concerned because a lot of stuff that tree surgeons are using, they'll be cutting it down because it's diseased or dying, particularly in, in urban situations. Um, I've become much less worried about it, uh, and there's a few reasons for that. One is mostly tree diseases will affect older, weak, dying trees. They mostly won't affect lovely young saplings that are in their youth of vigor. Um, and also mostly they won't be the same species you know so i probably wouldn't mulch some fresh ash tree plantings with a pure ash tree mulch that's come from a load of stuff with ash dieback you know so so you can still be a little bit careful but mostly i think i think the risk is low most tree diseases the spores are not carried in the wood chip um, mostly they're in the air, actually. They're mostly all around anywhere. You know, if, if you're going to get it, if a tree's susceptible and it's going to get it, it'll probably get it. So I don't think the wood chip mostly is adding much risk. Um, and, and the other thing, we're mostly composting our wood chip a little bit before we're using it. Um, so, and if you're worried, so if you did have a batch in that you thought, oh, that looks, you know, or you knew that it would come, say, from, you know, just ash dieback, Composting it first will remove most of those spores anyway. Um, uh, and and you know, particularly if you're using it on soil, uh, you know, as a soil amendment or in a, you know, vegetable system, they're not going to be the same diseases at all, you know. So, so I think the risk is pretty low. It's definitely not non-existent. There is a risk, uh, but I think you can mitigate it. Uh, and I've become relatively relaxed, I would say, about the risk of disease. Yeah, at the back. Now you've got to wait for the mic. <laughs> Strict instructions. Thank you. Uh, it's on. Um, so Rick Davies, a uh, farmer from between Northampton and Bedford. Uh, I've, I use quite a bit of wood chip um, already under sort of under my livestock, um, mostly for uh, sort of around the feed troughs, etc. Um, and then I, I mix that uh, into a compost, but. If you'd only work with just using wood chips straight onto arable land, um, and what kind of rates do you think you could put on without locking up too much nitrogen? And then, sorry, one, I've got a second question as well quickly. Just, I've got a few tree surgeons who bring me a lot of layland eye, and it makes me a bit nervous because it just seems quite caustic, toxic. I didn't know whether you've got any. So I'll start. I'll start with the Lelandia one because that's relatively quick. Uh, I think it's fine in a lot of situations. Um, I would say if you're starting to use it for something like a propagation compost, you don't want it at more than 25, 30% of a mix. I think if you're mulching trees of it, I think it's fine. I think any potential, so you know, conifers are one of the things that do have some of those volatile chemicals in the, in the leaves that can cause problems. But if you compost it for three to six months, most of them break down very quickly. So I think uh, I wouldn't use it fresh on soil probably, but if you compost it and if it's part of a mix, I think it's fine. The other question I think is, is quite interesting. And I mean, if, you, if I go back to, um, if I go back to, where are we? Sorry, that one. Uh, so that's the rate that, that it was being spread at in the Ramiel trial. Now what you'll notice there is that it's being spread on grass. Um, so so Tolly will only spread it on his uh, fertility lay. So he spreads it. While, and basically, the reason for that is to mitigate any potential risk. Having said that, Robert on the arable farm spread his chip directly onto the bare soil before sowing and didn't see, uh, he didn't see any harmful, uh, you know, any harmful effects. I think it depends a little bit on how composted the wood chip is. So if you're, you know, if you're using it mixed with, uh, you know, manure or out of your livestock system, 
then I think the risk is really low because it'll have quite a nitrogen benefit, you know, um, content anyway. Um, I can't remember the, uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember the rates in terms of cubic meters per ton, but it's all in the report. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not a mulch, it's a, it's a sprinkling. Um, and, and the other thing I would say is don't dig it in. Um, so leave it on top to, to break down a bit, because obviously rain has got some nitrogen in it, all of that stuff. And, and you know, I, where I said about it sort of touching one centimetre of the soil, you know, as soon as you dig it in, it's obviously touching one centimetre around every bit of the soil. Um, so your risk of, of lockup is much higher. Uh, and it's why, it's why, incidentally, using sawdust is just, a, or certainly fresh sawdust is a big no-no, because it's got a massive surface area. Um, where you see some of the real problems that have happened, often it's, it's sawdust. It doesn't mean sawdust can't be used, but you definitely need to mix in manure or something into that sawdust and compost it quite well. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah. <coughs> Sorry, we're choosing questions all around. Uh, middle on the left, and then after that on the right. Hi, thank you. Uh, Steve Fields, Zend from North Yorkshire. Just on your um, accidental experiment in 2018, would you have been worried about the height of wood chip and holding heat and moisture and potential uh, mould growth against stems of trees? Yes, I should have been. <laughs> um, I mean, as it happened, I think, I think the warmth, possibly. Um, I think mould, definitely. Now, as it happened, as you probably noticed, they were willow in that bit of the field, mostly. There was a couple of alders as well. Um, and obviously, they, they don't mind so much. They'll root all the way up the stem. Um, but yes, generally, you don't want to let the wood chip touch the bark um, because it will create moulds and you can get rot off. So, and, and again, I wouldn't recommend a two and a half foot mulch, um, although we, we are getting deeper. Um, so if you read the various studies that have been done around weed control and, and moisture retention, they recommend 10 to 15 centimetre deep mulch. I'm erring now more towards 20, 25 centimetres. Uh, but again, keeping it away from the trunk of the tree where possible. Um, but the, yeah, the heat one's interesting. I hadn't, um, I'm not sure I'd really thought about that, actually. Um, it is a risk, I guess. Um, but probably, at, I don't know, at two foot, it probably, you know, because it's sort of that, it's probably okay. I think if you went up to there, it would be more of a risk. But yeah, I didn't, I didn't measure the temperature of the, in the middle of it, but yeah. You, you touched on someone designing a machine that collected hedge clippings when hedges are being cut. Can you enlarge on that? Well, I can't. The uses. Because someone told me about it, and then when I tried to find it, I couldn't find it. So I don't know if it was a myth or, or you know, it, it didn't work or something. I mean, it, clearly, you can do it. Uh, you just need a collector on your flail. The question, I guess, is whether it's worth it. Um, you know, whether the cost of the development or whether the amount of wood chip that you would get and having to empty it all the time is worth the effort, I guess. Um, I think my gut instinct is that it's it's probably too much hassle for the amount of material you get and you're better off, you know, coppicing. Um, but it might be, you know, particularly, I guess, if you're doing it along roads where actually it creates a problem on the road when you leave it all there, you know, there could be benefits. But yeah, I don't, I, I can't, I'm afraid. Uh, there was a question at the front. The dog wants to ask a question. Thank you. Um, have you got any experience on biomass, uh, a wood chip for biomass, as in putting in boilers? No, I don't, I'm afraid. I've very deliberately avoided that. I mean, I, I do think there's potential, and I think there's potential for, uh, for the two working together quite well, because obviously the wood chip that you might want for your soil often is the stuff that's not quite good enough quality to go into boilers. So I think I, I am into, you know, I had a, interesting, I had a visit to Drax a few weeks ago. Uh, with the potential of exploring agroforestry supply into Drax, which is kind of like, okay, that's kind of interesting. But, um, but I, think, I think at a small scale on farm, having a system that could both feed your, your boiler but also create, that could be really useful. But I'm, yeah, I, d I know very little about the biomass. But. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. How long would you 
would you have to leave? Oh, sorry, that's not on. It is. It should be on. Have it closer. How long <laughs> after your chips and fresh willow would you have to leave it so that before you could use it so it wouldn't regrow? Thank you. Uh, sorry, say that, say that again. How long would you have to leave freshly cut willow, which has been chipped, before you could apply it as a mulch <laughs> around your trees to stop it growing? Okay, so you can apply it straight away. I and mean, it depends what you want from it. So uh, if you want that effect of the salicylic acid, you actually need to apply it really fresh, like within two weeks of chipping it, because otherwise the salicylic acid leaches out. Uh, once it's chipped, it doesn't seem to grow? No. So oh, I haven't seen it grow. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, any, I think it's just small enough that it's not enough power for it to grow. I mean, probably if you put a chip carefully in the soil and planted it, it might. But I think because it's, yeah, I haven't seen any regrowth from chips. So, yeah, no, it's a good question. I hadn't thought of that, but yeah. Uh, there was a question, yeah. Hello there. You touched on different species and their breakdown rates, but you, did you touch on the diameter and the breakdown rates at all of the wood chip? No. Uh, clearly, it will have an impact. So the bigger the chip, the longer it will take to break down, of course. Um, I don't know of any research that's looked at that. Uh, I mean, I don't, I, apart from the, the field lab, so we did, uh, we were looking at amendments in top fruit. Um, and then the RHS garden at Wisley was the only the only place that had single species wood chip, and they had hornbeam under one of their rows, which they just noticed lasted for a lot longer. That's that's the only experience I have of knowing that sort of these hard chips are, are more effective. Um, so I think yes, clearly the bigger the chip and the harder the wood, the longer it will last. And any sort of mulch suppression more more. I mean, like, I notice in willow, when I apply willow uh, mulch, because it's, I often have, like, longer, thinner bits in it, and it kind of creates a harder mat. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you're mixing different parts of wood chips with different parts of trees, so, as you said, different diameter, under 7 mil or whatever, then, like, if it would create a better weed suppression or really, not. Really good question. I don't know. And, I mean, the other thing, because the other thing you sometimes get is a kind of, you know, the fungi, the hyphae kind of create this kind of barrier, which again works. But, but yes, I don't, apart from that kind of anecdotal looking at it, it's, a, it's an interesting question. There's things like walnut, for instance, do, you know, are known to have an allopathic effect um, from the juglone in it, but, but it's only temporary. So it's only, it'll only last for two or three months. So, so it's more, as you said, that kind of structure of the chip maybe. Uh, and, and interestingly, the, there's a really good study of um, wood chip for livestock bedding um, where he found that the the structure of the um, bark made a difference. So so where you shredded it, it created these long bits that then meant that it didn't drain as freely. So so actually the structure of that layer is quite interesting. There's probably more. So there's so much we don't know, basically. Uh, yeah. I was wondering how long you need to compost wood chip to mitigate the possibility um, of, of getting fungal spores from your composting wood chip, uh, breathing them in. I've done it, um, but on wood chip that's only been in it, sitting on a pile on the, on the hard for about a week or 10 days, and then moving it and getting immersed in a cloud. Yeah, it's a really good point. And, and I would say wear a mask if you're moving wood chip because you can get some really nasty um, effects from it. Uh, I don't know in terms of how long. It, it will depend on temperature and species and you know all the rest of it. Um, <clears throat> but, but yes, you do have to be careful about fungal spores. Um, so I would say, you know, definitely, if, if, particularly if it's freshest, then yeah, wear a mask. Um, but I would imagine that sort of six months to nine months, it's probably okay. But what I've found sometimes, you know, we because we end up with these massive piles of wood chip where, you know, we sort of had them delivered and pushed them up and had them delivered. And there's sort of a pocket at the back that hasn't been touched for a while. You know, you go back and it might be a year and a half, you know, that's been sitting there and there's still a patch in the middle that was really dry and hasn't, you know, actually hasn't properly composted. And that's where you get this kind of, you know, explosion of spores. So you do need to be careful. But yeah, thank you for, for that.
for the question, but I don't, I don't have an answer in terms of how long, but. Hi, yes, lovely talk. Thanks very much, really informative. Um, is there any wood that you wouldn't chip? I don't think there is, really. I mean, there are certain woods for certain situations. So, yeah, I wouldn't put blackthorn in for livestock bedding, for instance. Um, but generally, I think pretty much anything can be used. And, and the more diverse the species are, the less risk there is. But actually, one of the things I'm really interested in is the potential of single-species mulches for specific uses. Um, you know, so the willow thing, obviously, is one example. But really, the only things I've come across are willow and... Um, and then sometimes some of the uh, things like uh, cypress and you know so where where they've been shown to have an allopeptic factor on, on weeds. But there's you know each one of them's got this sort of complex chemistry that potentially could be harnessed. Um, but yeah, I th I think most things are good. You know even eucalyptus if it's added into something is is not going to be harmful. I don't think so. Right on. Hi, uh, Graham from CPRE. Um, we did a report called Hedge Fund, which also we looked at the ARC, looking at the importance of hedgerows and wood chip for farming. So I'm really pleased you mentioned it. It was a great talk, Ben, and the issue of seeing hedges as a resource. That my question really is about um, the, the locking up of nitrogen. I wonder whether you'd got any figures on that, because what strikes me is, of course, in some parts of the country, chicken manure is a real problem for pollution of the Y and the tone and the parrot and so forth, whether that might be a part solution to that. But do you have any sense of how much nitrogen would get locked up for how long and how long that slow release would be to help uh, with that kind of solution? I don't, off the top of my head, I don't. There was one study that I looked at when writing the book, which was where they were using it with the artificial nitrogen. And I think there were some figures about how much it locked up. I suspect it will depend on a number of things. But, but yeah, I, absolutely, for chicken manure, it's, it's got to be helpful. For sure, but no, I, I, I haven't off the top of my head. But I, I, there, I think there is some information on that. I might, I'll maybe look into it after some follow-up. But yeah, any other questions? A couple over there. Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> hello, Ben. Um, yeah, my name's Andy McIver Edward. We we farm in Cornwall. Um, you mentioned um, trials on compost with uh, wood chip on its own and with biochar is there is there any added advantage by putting biochar in or is it is it worth the extra hassle oh, that's a good question I, and i have done some other work on biochar so i'm quite interested in biochar i think uh i think some of the biochar claims are uh, overblown but i do think in propagation it has some potential and i first got interested in it uh when i i had did a, a little trial with some uh, coir compost and coir with biochar and everything that I'd sowed in the biochar came up a day earlier and was greener. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. I mean, it didn't then make any difference to the final crop, I have to say, but it was quite interesting in terms of, and, and it's, you know, one of the theories is that plants have evolved to grow more quickly when there's burnt material in, in the soil. So the idea is that after a forest fire, the things that come up quickest are the ones that survive. So there's sort of gradual evolution. Um, and and it's why in th it's why I know that um, uh, you know uh, green and blacks did this uh, biochar experiments with their cacao trees, and so again where trees are young and at establishment, it seems to sort of make them grow more quickly, particularly at establishment stage. Um, so we didn't in that trial we didn't see any clear sort of advantage or correlation other than that the the peat with biochar seemed to also have the benefit that the wood chip compost did. Um, generally, I would say, my, my feeling with biochar is there's, there's a benefit in propagation, there's a benefit in really poor soils, so sandy soils or uh, protected cropping where you get this sort of real extremes of uh, moisture and temperature, it sort of acts as a buffer. Um, so I, I, I think there is potential. Um, we've used it at Eastbrook but we're on heavy clay, it's really rich soil. I, if I'm honest, I haven't seen any real benefit to using it there, so I think it depends, probably. Thanks, this is probably a naive question, but I'm interested in the spatial potential for this application. The, sorry, what potential? Spatial potential, yeah. okay. I mean, there's, I think there's eight and a half million hectares of farmland in England. 
which coincidentally is the same as one state in India, Andhra Pradesh. But if we said that it would be good to say 10%, put 10% of the land down to um, put wood chip on 10% of the farmland, is that realistic? Where does this wood chip come from? You know, what's the, what's the potential to, to take this to scale? So, so I think there's massive potential. And, and particularly, you know, if you're looking at livestock systems, I think the benefits that those trees will bring to the system make sense on their own, even without the wood chip. You know, so there's, there's lots of evidence around improved animal health, you know, improved productivity through shade, shelter, you know, browse with increased micronutrients and tannins. So there's lots of, there's lots of evidence that the trees will improve the productivity of systems. I think in livestock systems, it's quite immediate and, and almost a no-brainer. I think it's a bit more complicated in cropping situations. So I think... I think the wood chip almost becomes a kind of useful byproduct of a diverse system. Um, but it potentially means, you know, if there are lots of trees being planted for those other benefits, you know, some of them have to be managed. Some of them are just going to grow into trees, and that's great. But some of them will need to be managed. Uh, and actually, wood chip is a really good way of spreading that benefit around. Um, and, you know, I think. Again, it's interesting looking at Ian Tolhurst, where you know he doesn't have livestock other than his worms, um, but he's got this sort of acre of willow on land that's too wet to grow veg on, and effectively he's using the fertility from that acre to boost his production on the rest of the farm. And I think you know, if if we're looking at going, okay, well we do have that area of slightly unproductive land, it could produce something. You know, rather than trying to grow crops on it, we could use it as a way of boosting our you know, our productivity on the, the bits that we are cropping. So I, seeing it again as part of that kind of whole holistic thing, I think there's huge potential. Yeah, at the front. Um, Hang on, you've got to wait for the mic, sorry. <laughs> and I think this might have to be the last question. Uh, ev everything so far has been about um, arable and horticulture. Has there been any studies done at all on the benefits of wood chip being applied to either permanent pasture or to lays? No, is the short answer. It's it's one of the things we're experimenting with or wanting to experiment with at Eastbrook. So we've got one of the fields we've got uh, mostly peri pears, but interplanted with willow and alder. And our plan is to coppice the willow and alder and spread it into the you know the paddocks in between the rows of trees, uh, with the hope of improving the productivity of the grassland. So I think. I think there is potential, but I, I don't know of much work that's been done on it. But yeah. Well, thank you all very much. Really appreciate all the questions as well. Thank you.